He called me and was like, look, this is what happened. This is how it went down. This is how much they got paid. And I'm so sorry, you know, <sighs> but I know you resigned. Did you did you sign a um a termination letter or you know did they let you out the contract? I was like, yeah, I've been I've been out of the contract as an artist. I was like, but the thing is, you know, this is not good because I still own the copyright. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Indie Unplugged. My name is B. Vaughn, of course, and today I have an amazing guest with me, Miss Tammy Luttrell. I'm going to, as I always do, I take a moment to introduce all the guests, right, give them their flowers. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> here we go. Uh, Tammy Luttrell, a visionary in the music industry whose influence stretches far beyond the confines of the recording studio. A multi-platinum Grammy-nominated songwriter, Tammy has penned Hits for legends like Whitney Houston, Keisha Cole, and so many more, earning her a respected spot in the annals of history. Her transformative journey from artist to advocate led her to establish the Mezzo Agency, where she champions the rights of music creators, ensuring they are fairly compensated for their work. As the founder and CEO of the Mezzo Agency, Tammy has not only recovered hundreds of thousands in unclaimed royalties, but has also been pivotal in figuring uh, in... Uh, Helping to really, this one for me was probably the biggest one, the Music Modernization Act. She was very pivotal in establishing that act, which really changed the way that artists are compensated in the digital age. So ladies and gentlemen, join us today as we delve deep into Tammy's journey, uh, her history, Tammy, welcome. Thank you so much, Welcome Brian, to the Indian for Plug. having me. Thank you You're for the welcome. intro. Yeah, let's get the, <laughs> get the clap. Oh, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been, a, it's been a minute. It has. It's been a minute. Um, well, I mean, January. I think January was the last time was I saw you. was the last time. Yeah, yeah. And a lot has happened. This is August. Yeah. That's a and long time. So fast. I'm like, what is going on? We only have what five more months left. That's it. In the year. That's it. Yeah. Good. Good. I'm hanging on. Hanging on. <laughs> hanging on. Yeah. I know you're extremely busy. Yes, I so am. So thank you for taking the time, waking up on a early, you know, Saturday morning to be to be here. Yes, and uh, shout out to my daughter because <laughs> she. <laughs> I just dropped off her track practice, but she was like, "Mom, isn't your interview today?" And I'm like. It is. <laughs> oh, Even shoot, though I right. had the reminder yesterday and everything, but thankfully we are all on the same side of town, mm, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where, where I drop profit. So it just worked out perfectly. What is she what does she do in track? So, oh my God, my superstar daughter. She is um she runs the two hundred. Uh she's on varsity track at Woodward. She runs the two hundred, the four hundred, the four by four. And I want to say the four by two. Oh, oh, she does track track. Oh, yeah. She's, she's yeah, been yeah, running yeah. since she was six. Yeah. Oh, She'll wow. be 17 in November. Wow. So I'm sure she was probably glued to the track and field during the Olympics. Oh, yeah. She was oh, yeah. watching them on the way here. She oh. was watching all of <laughs> everything. That, just all the recaps and stuff. She's really big on like looking at recaps mm -hmm. and watching it over and over. She was obsessed. Mm -hmm. And I love it for her. Mm -hmm. See, yeah. I didn't watch the Olympics, but I watched... All the so I used to do track and field when I was in high school. Okay. I, was, I was pretty fast. Okay, not fast today, right? You know, you get older. I mean, but, hey, but back in the day in high school, I was pretty fast. So I ran a whole uh, bunch of stuff in um, in high school. And what was so crazy is that so I'm watching all the highlights and I'm watching different races and you know watching people. You know, the I'm gonna tell you, Shakari is absolutely a beast. fast. Like she is so fast. Oh my gosh, she is so fast. And so I'm watching, you know, all the highlights. And then I'm on Facebook and I see one of my high school friends post. And he's like, you know, congratulations to my son. He won gold at oh the Olympics. God. I was like, what? He won gold. And so I went back to, to watch the race. Quincy Hall. Mm. I was like, oh, oh, wow. wow. He pulled that. He pulled yeah. that and won that gold. Yeah. But I didn't. Really did. I was like, wow. I, I was like super proud for my 
high school friend. Right. Like right. your son it's his just son. you your son won gold. It's possible. It's po- it's everything's possible. Yeah, and she's been talking my daughter's been talking about being an Olympian since she was 6 7 years old. So mm. like I have, you know, dedicated my life as a track mom, you know, making sure that she has everything she needs. All the hot days of sitting out at the track meets all day long, uh, bringing, you know, snacks and, you know, making sure she's hydrated. Mm-hmm. And it has been definitely a journey, but uh, she is incredible at what she does and she really takes care of herself. And, you know, mom's rooting her on every step of the way. That's what's up. That's why I can't wait to see highlights of her yes. in the Olympics. So we've already started compiling all of her races from mm-hmm. since you know from mm-hmm. from uh when she was younger so uh, i have a drop box full of all of her videos wow. and you know of course we're thinking about you know college and you know where she'll be going and what that party is going to look like mm-hmm. when it's time to graduate you know just mm-hmm. really you know trying to be intentional um ahead of time to make it the best uh transition for her track scholarship Definitely. Yeah, that's right. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I don't think, you know, she's worked this hard to not get one, that's you right. know, so we, we know for sure that, you know, God will be blessing her with that. Mm, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so, yeah. So, Tammy, once again, welcome to the India Unplugged. Uh, so kind of <laughs> as I start with every guest, kind of give, give us your journey. Ooh, How'd you okay. get started? In, you know, um, where you today? So, yeah, I got started very young. I would say between the age of like 14, 15. Um, you know, I started really wanting to be out front as an artist, a performer. Um, I was the one singing in all the school talent shows, um, had a girl group in middle school and, you know, just kind of at the school, Mm -hmm. you know, just being that girl, like, oh, she's going to be a singer one day, you know? Um, I had actually really had no, not, well, I wouldn't say no, but I, I just, I didn't have a lot of knowledge on the power of songwriting at the time um, because what we saw, you know, uh, was always the artist Mm -hmm. in the forefront. So you just kind of assume that all that was the artist, you know, um, as far as the song, the music, the performing, you know, you you would think that the artist did everything. Um, So that's what I wanted to do. I, I can recall being as young as five, six years old, maybe sitting in front of, the television watching video soul you know and video soul and you know watching Whitney performing um on her videos and just in my mind like oh my god you know she looks like me you know and um you know I aspired to you know be like Whitney Mm -hmm. so um throughout the journey like I said that was you know when I was really young but about 14 15 I I got the bug of just wanting to perform I'm the one at the family reunions performing and singing in front of everybody and nobody knows the songs that are my favorite songs because of course I'm just in my room studying all of the CD booklets Mm -hmm. and looking at all the credits and you know just really learning like oh it takes a it's a whole process to build a song you have an engineer you have the songwriters, the producers, the musicians, it's not just about the artist. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's how, you know, I kind of got exposed to like the behind the scenes of it all, but, you know, still wanting to perform. So um, around 16, 17-ish, um, I joined a girl group in high school and um, it was called Best Kept Secret. And um, one of the young ladies is still my sis to this day, Brooke Valentine. Mm. Shout out to Brooke. I understand. Um, she and I both, you know, we um, gave our all to um, wanting to be a part of something that we felt was incredible at the time. And um, and so, you know, our journeys have changed and, you know, we've both evolved. Um, I, I left the group first um, and decided to go solo. And I just wanted to do things different because mm-hmm. that I enjoyed the journey of like being in the studio and helping the producer with writing songs and just really, mm-hmm. you know, getting behind the mic and understanding structure and things like that. But I, I wanted to go in a different direction because I did so much. I, would, I danced, um, was incredible at writing. I, I just started seeing like, oh, I, I really got a thing for this, mm-hmm. you know. Um, helped co-write a few of the songs that we did for our project and 
we did some shows and tours and stuff like that. But I just felt like, you know, it would be best for me to um, pursue other um, endeavors. And so I went on to become a solo artist and signed with an indie label. I really only signed because one of my my guy brother signed. And so it was just kind of like, well, if you signed, I then I can sign too. Right. Just so we can like continue to co-write and, and collaborate together. Because I had featured on a lot of his songs. Shout out to Endo. Um, he's in Houston. Uh, incredible lyricist. He taught me so much about song structure as well. He taught me how to rap. He taught me just so much. And I'm forever grateful for that. Um, and then... Things didn't go uh, as planned with the indie <laughs> label, so I decided to um, move move along. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I talked to my parents about it, and they've always been so supportive. Shout out to my parents, Lord, Mama. Right, shout out to parents, man. Everybody, listen to your mama, okay? <laughs> uh, she uh, is my number one fan, and has definitely. Um, you know, been my voice of reason. And at that time, I was just so like, Mom, what am I going to do? Because I really don't want to have to start over. But I just don't think that, you know, um, the this current situation was really conducive to mm -hmm. where I was trying to go. And uh, she was like, well, you know, it's okay. Just make sure before you walk away from anything, just make sure you take care of yourself, protect yourself. Um, and, you know, I, I, I took... I took that advice, and uh, I so I turned in my termination letter, let them know, hey, you know, I think we need to part and go separate ways, and I left, and I received or accepted, rather, a full scholarship to my alma mater, which is Texas Southern University in Houston, uh, Go Tigers, <laughs> and uh, TSU Proud, and uh, I just was like, you know, I don't really know what's about to happen, but I'm not giving up on myself. Right. I started working on my own independent mixtape. I was hustling mixtapes around the campus. <laughs> I was taking pictures with my fans at the time. And, you know, there, you know, just was no other way outside of printing your CDs and selling right. them and, you know, hoping somebody, will, you know, purchase them for you. And I was just on a grind. I also performed in some of the talent shows and events that we had on campus, um, and next thing you know, my mom calls me while I'm in my dorm room and says that she needs to talk to me about something important. And I'm thinking someone passed in our family, you know, thinking right, it's like right, something like, right. you know, familial, like, oh, what's going on? She's like, uh, well, if you turn on 102 right now, Whitney Houston is on the radio singing your song. What you looking at? Oh, man. And Imagine I was that. like, huh? I was so confused. Like. I had just came in. It was hot. You know, I'm like trying to get settled in right. from walking the campus, the yard. So I just was not expecting that. But, um, yeah, she was right. I turned on the radio in my room and Whitney Houston was on the radio singing what you're looking at right at that time, at that moment. Like it was wow. like her new debut. I actually think that they played it like back to back because it was like fresh mm -hmm. and new. You know how they'll do those exclusives. Mm -hmm. So I was freaking out. Um, I'm kind of delayed reactionary type mm -hmm. person to where you know something could happen and I I've I've been always taught to remain calm in like weird situations crazy mm -hmm. situations um so but there was like so many waves of emotion from oh my god excitement to how what I'm confused you know it was like how did this happen I was ecstatic mm -hmm. it was almost like magic you know, it was like so many things all at once. It was like, I felt chosen, <laughs> you know, like, I was like Whitney Houston, <laughs> you know, she chose, me. she chose my song, you right. know? So it was just a wave of emotion um, that really had me like, I don't know what to do. So after the shock wore off, um, I got busy and I was making phone calls. And of course, no one was answering. Mm. Everybody's forgotten about me. Mm. And so uh, I started reaching out. Um, I want to say we had like beepers at the time. Probably. Yeah, what, I think when, we had beepers what, what and cell phones. What year was this? This was 2000. 2001. We probably 2001. still had beepers there. I think yeah, we still yeah, had oh, beepers yeah, or did. Nextel yeah, chirp yeah. something like that. I didn't have a Nextel and I didn't have like the little, the little Blackberry mm -hmm. thing. So it had to have been a phone and a beeper. I don't know. But anyway, I know I was trying to get in touch with everybody, 
by any means of communication that I could. And I just kept getting pushed, no pushback, no, I mean, pushback and no response. And so, um, you know, it really got to the point to where I was like, um, I was just kind of, I was frustrated, you know, and Mm -hmm. I just felt taken advantage of. And, you know, the producer and I, you know, he was very instrumental in my life, um, still is. His name is Muhammad 2G. Um, but he really taught me a lot about the production process um, because he was incre- an incredible, he's an, an incredible composer. Um, he's also Muslim. So he taught me a lot about that faith when I worked with him and collaborated a lot. And I learned a lot about my health and food and just discipline and all kinds of things. So I really thought that that was just you know, it was hurtful that we didn't really get a chance to connect at the time. But at the same time, I had to continue. I had to consider what he was going through mm-hmm. because he was still at the label, mm-hmm. you know. So once my feelings kind of wore off on that, then, um, you know, I received a phone call from one of the friends who shall remain nameless within that circle. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you never tell your story. That's right. So... He called me and was like, look, this is what happened. This is how it went down. This is how much they got paid. And I'm so sorry, you know, oh, but I know you were signed. Did you did you sign a um a termination letter or, you know, did they let you out the contract? I was like, yeah, I've been I've been out of the contract as an artist. I was like, but the thing is, you know, this is not good because I still own the copyright. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I wrote the song. So I registered all of my copyrights with the, with the song. And he was like, well, I don't understand. Like, but you're the artist, you're signed to the label. Doesn't the label, you know, like, don't they own that now? And I was like, no, when I signed over my rights as an artist, that's just on the master side. Mm-hmm. That's the sound recording copyright. That has nothing to do with who actually wrote the song. And he's like, oh, I, yeah, I was just going to tell you, you're going to have to bite this bullet. Not today. And I'm like, well, no, we're not doing that. We're not biting no bullets. OK, so um, he was like, well, man, I don't know. Uh, that kind of changes. And I'm like, exactly. It does. So lo and behold, that message got communicated in some way. Oh, I'm sure. And I got a phone call from the CEO. And so, um. You know, it's no, it's no issues here anymore. You know, we met, I sat with him, um, and, uh, you know, to his surprise, you know, he, you know, clearly didn't understand at the time what all rights I had. Mm. And that's understandable. And that's why I left the label because I was very clear that there was a lot going on that unfortunately he just wasn't privy to. And that, that was a problem for me, you know? So, um, we sat over dinner and I lunch, whatever it was at the Cheesecake Factory in the gallery. And I um, explained to him about the the, the songwriting uh, ownership. And he was like, okay, well, let's work out an agreement. You know, we've already been paid out and everything and the album's pressed up and all that, but I definitely can at least give you the publishing. Mm-hmm. And so I got, he put me on the phone with Arista. It was a three-way call. Of course, they were like, who is this young girl? We've never heard of her. Where did she come from? You know? And so, but we all decided to split the song amicably. Um, we gave Whitney 10% and, you know, Dre, Jerry, and I, uh, Muhammad 2G, we split the song. Um, and that was it, mm. you know. Um, that was the beginning of solidifying myself as a songwriter. Wow. And the album went on to go platinum. Um, there were a few remixes done. I know she did a video. Um, it's the video that was going around where Mike Epps was, doing some comedy mm-hmm. at the front. And then I think Offset was dancing mm-hmm. when he was young. Um, oh, wow. And so that went viral. And everybody's like, oh, this was Offset when he was in Whitney Houston's video. So that's the song mm-hmm. that I wrote. Mm-hmm. And so uh, called What You're Looking At. And uh, the rest is history. That was really kind of like what kicked off my career and took me, it whisked me into a whole nother direction to where now I'm at college. I'm in college um, um, on the university campus going to class and in the studio at night and I may have to leave and fly out, you know, to go and write. Um, it afforded me the opportunity to work with some incredible producers, uh, Errol, E. Poppy, Makala. He's also in Houston. He produced Dangerously in Love for Beyonce. Mm-hmm. He produced for Missy Elliott, Truth Hurts. Um, just so many incredible performers. 
um, he, I was introduced to him by a former manager and um, we started working and he was like, you know, you're dope. Like, let's vibe out. Let's continue to work. He really appreciated that. I like to work from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of songwriters, you know, were doing that at that time. What, is, what does that mean? Work from scratch? Just, you know, kind of coming in with a clean slate as a creative. He may be like just playing a few things on the MPC or he may be playing some keys, you know, just different sounds and stuff. And I would just kind of allow myself to flow mm -hmm. with it until I get a melody. And then he's like, yeah, stay right there. And then okay. he'll add maybe like a kick or a drum or, you know, and before you know it, we have a whole song and mm -hmm. it's just my melodies. Um, and, you know, maybe I'm kind of like piecing together how a song could come out, but maybe I just came up with the hook and we right. don't even have words yet. We just have a melody for the hook. Right. Um, and then I start from there transcribing the melody after I lay it down in a mm. booth and then it becomes like a full song, just all gibberish melodies, <laughs> right, you right. know? Yeah. And then I just, I transcribe them into lyrics, you know, piece by piece. And so he was, you know, he was like, this is dope. And I mean, he taught me on how, how to engineer my own uh, recording, you know, because, you know, sometimes I just wanted to be able to work and have an idea before I come to him mm. and be like, hey, let's like, you know, let's, this is what came to me last night, you know. So he encouraged me to get my own equipment. Um, I ended up getting through him also. I got a pub deal with EMI Music Publishing under the direction of Big John Platt. Nice. So that was incredible. Um, and I just got a chance to really immerse myself into the world of being an actual sought out elite group with an elite group of songwriters and producers mm -hmm. I was I became one of them you know mm -hmm. and at the time the industry was not like it is now where you have just have this influx of open gates of wide uh a, a broad spectrum of songwriters and producers it was really like a superpower mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. everybody just couldn't be a songwriter of that caliber or a producer of mm -hmm. that caliber you had to be sought out you had to be developed. You had to be, you know, amongst the greats or, you know, chosen by the greats to be a part of it. That was when, to me, the industry was more, there were a lot of gatekeepers, mm -hmm. but it was protected for a reason because there was so much integrity in the craft of development. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Artists were being developed fully. Fully <laughs> developed. Fully developed from, sure. you know, you know, from getting their health together to, you know, choreography to voice lessons mm -hmm. to, you know, um, media training, uh, showcases, getting feedback, you know, doing small tours with, you know, uh, groups like us mm -hmm. where, you know, the record labels would come to us. You know, um, Big John would throw these conferences every year and the conferences would consist of every single record label executive Wow. They would fly out and meet with us. It was like a three day conference and we would be in a huge conference room at some elaborate hotel. Mm -hmm. I love the perks. <laughs> and, you know, we would be in conference all day um, with them discussing their projects, their new artists, their current artists, what they're working on, how well they've done, how, you know, badly, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a, a project didn't do too well and they're trying to go into a different direction. But they were very transparent with us. That was how I met L.A. Reid, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Sylvia oh, Ron, just the greats, you know. I, I'm just so grateful to have had those memories. Um, uh, so many executives. Um, and, and, you know, it was just really life changing mm -hmm. for me. I can go on and on, but I also got a chance to build a bridge and connect and grow friendships with so many songwriters and producers sure. that I'm friends with to this day. We're like the veterans now, mm -hmm. you know, um, and we just kind of have that um, that knowing that, you know, we were able to experience what the music industry was right. compared to what it is now. Right. And so, you know, you just kind of like look at each other like, dang, like look mm. at all that we've accomplished and mm. and, and the type of money we used to make back then compared mm -hmm. to the type of money that's out there now. So, I mean, you know, it's a it's a win-win, um, but at the same time, 
we miss CD sales. Okay. Right. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. just to, I didn't want to, you know, go on that, that whole tangent, but <laughs> I had to put that out there that, you know, we have definitely, you know, being a veteran in this business now for over 20 years, we have definitely seen um, a decline in the way writers, producers, creators make money. Mm. And so, um, you know, my career going on, you know, in writing for EMI and then, um, you know, being able to be sought out for certain projects privately, you know, to where mm -hmm. they just have these like private writing mm -hmm. camps and all that stuff. And nobody knows about mm -hmm. it. You got to be hush and sign NDAs and all that type of stuff. It really afforded me to, you know, establish myself at a very young age. So um, one thing I didn't do was drop out of school. My mom was like, Stay in, school. Like, no, you stay in school. Okay, sure. because you'll be the first to graduate with your degree in our family. We need this. Um, I'm also the oldest too, so I have a lot of, you know, younger siblings looking up That's to right. me. Pressure. No pressure. Press, pressure. Setting the right. setting the example, yes. right? Setting the example. So and then also I was still writing, you know, mm -hmm. I was still traveling. I was still, you know, back and forth, um, you know, in and out of campus or whatever. I remember one day I came into my roommate. This is before I, I moved out and, and got my own place. But uh, my roommate was like, so are you going to go to a college party with us at any time? Like just one time maybe. And I was like, you know, I've never been to a college party. You know, I'm on a H I'm at a HBCU. Like, so the parties are who they are, you mm -hmm. know, of course, because I, I started going. And um, I was so happy to have had that experience where, you know, I still – had a you know a budding career i'm traveling a lot but i'm still making time to be a young adult mm -hmm. and That's getting important. the college experience and you know just all the drama that comes around being on college campuses i sit back and think about it sometimes and just laugh like we were so dumb you know <laughs> <laughs> but we had a great i had a great i had a great run at, at texas southern and um, shout out to, to TSU again. They have just been doing incredible things and we have so many incredible alumni that have come out of the university. So, mm -hmm. but anyway, moving on, um, as a young adult, I did graduate with my degree in journalism and PR, um, in the school of communications. Cause obviously writing is, it's a form of communication, me, right? That's so I right. learned how to, uh, write, uh, news stories. Um, of course, um, all different types of news stories, different topics, being able to build websites from scratch. Hello, HTML. HTML. The See? mic is on. <laughs> like Prince said. <laughs> we we That's built right. websites when there were no templates. No templates. Okay. It was all HTML. All yes, HTML. All a, HTML. You gotta put your little, you know, your uh, A herf equals. Exactly. With the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the whole language. A whole and language. Um, what was crazy is when I remember I told you I had accepted a full scholarship. Mm -hmm. Um that was in computer science. And I changed my major within my, yeah, my second, because I had to declare my major. So before I declared computer science, mm -hmm. even though I had already been in the program, I was like, you know, I don't know if I really want to make it hard on myself with me being so creative and having to leave and working yeah, and all that stuff. Yeah. But computer science it was like different. I had to sit in rooms that were really dark and cold yep. and quiet. Yep. And we were doing a lot of binary yep. numbers. And I just was like, this yeah, ain't no, for me. this ain't for me. <laughs> so I was like, I want to be around something that encourages me to write and, you know, really be creative. And so right. that's how I ended up um, graduating uh, with my degree in journalism and PR. I uh, specialized in advertising and marketing. And then I also minored in business. So I went to business school my last two years and just got the whole gamut. But Tammy got the whole skill set. I'm telling In case y'all don't know. It was a real plan. Y'all don't know. It's real plan. Real skill sets, right? It was a real plan because I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to go into anything media like after it. Right. But I know that that is an integral part of the future. I mm -hmm. knew that, you know, there was going to be a change in all of this. It wasn't just going to be analog that tapes and all that type of stuff anymore. Right. <clears throat> but I wanted to at least be educated once I knew that we were dealing with like the web, the internet and stuff. So I felt like just having an idea about media, advertising, marketing, because I've always been obsessed with that. Like Boomerang is one of my favorite movies. You know, uh, so. I, Isn't today something with, with Boomerang today? Something with Boomerang? Is it? I got to look it up. I, I got to. What do you mean? I saw a post about something about Boomerang today. Is it, a, is it an anniversary? Is it like an anniversary today? I don't know. Oh, my God. That would be so I, epic. But uh, yeah. I, I'm, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm a researcher. I got to figure out right. is, is that true or not. But yeah. I did see somebody post something up about that. Today. Yes, I was obsessed with that whole entire world of just mm-hmm. understanding how ads came mm-hmm. about and how people, you know, when that movie came out, it was just like, oh, my God, that's something I could possibly do one day, you know. Mm-hmm. But anyway, um, that's what compelled me to kind of get, a, you know, the background and not only being able to know how to work in a newsroom and actually craft stories from start to finish mm-hmm. and also be able to work on the beat. Like when you got to turn something in, like within five minutes, you right, know, right, um, and then right. the reporter has to get on air and talk about it. And, you know, mm-hmm. you have to be the one behind the scenes, like giving them the cues and all this stuff. So I really got that that background. And then I was like, well, I need to know business. I need to re- just period. I know I'm going to mm-hmm. be a businesswoman one day. Um, I just need to learn business. So that whole that whole experience of understanding finance and marketing and operations and all that stuff was, you know, it was it was it was the foundation. It definitely was not in depth compared to what <laughs> right, I right. know now. Right. Uh, being an entrepreneur. But it was it was a great foundation for me. And so from there, I was able to graduate and then I was full time a songwriter. And that was it. That's all I was. I was like, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Mm. I also loved about what I loved about being a songwriter compared to being a performer is that it seemed like when I would talk to some of the artists that we were collaborating with who were like up and coming because, mm. you know, EMI, because it was such a respected brand, a lot of the songwriters would be with the artists before the world even knows mm-hmm. who they are. So they're kind of still in development and you're like trying to find their sound and you know, just really mm-hmm. trying to work with them to see where that magic is going to kick in. Right. And so I re- recall one of the artists, I, she shall remain nameless because I respect her to this day and she's incredible. But I remember her being so exhausted mm-hmm. as an artist because she has all these deadlines. She's a performer. She's, you know, having to go to rehearsals. She's having to like do a, a perform at a showcase. She's having to, you know, mix and mingle with mm-hmm. these new executives that are coming in town. She was just like, I just don't understand how they expect me to do all this. And then I have to be creative and come in the studio and work for hours and hours Hours. at a time to, you know, get the song done. I'm just exhausted. I'm tired. And in my mind, I was like, thank God I'm a songwriter (laughs) because (laughs) all I have to do is come in. I can dress however I want. If if I'm even if I'm in my PJs, you know, and at, at that time, once I got my own studio set up at home, that's what I was doing. I would wake up in the middle of the night, sometimes roll over, lay an idea down in Pro Tools and roll over and go right back to sleep, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I just really started seeing that this is where God had me planted because he knew what was best for me, you right. know. And um, I loved also that I had my own privacy. Nobody really knew who I was except people <laughs> in the industry. I could still mm. like go everywhere, you know, mm-hmm. and just be myself, my whimsical mystical self Mm -hmm. you know and and be creative and still be in my own world and show up when I need to deliver I was always always very passionate and outspoken and you know really good with structure and collaborating Mm -hmm. and all that stuff so it was a really great journey for me I went on to write for Keisha Cole um I wrote a song called Falling Out um on her Just Like You album we actually wrote that song originally for Brandy Mm. Brandy was you know in my mind, she was my friend. She was your friend. I was like, <laughs> I'm going to be friends with Brandy. Right. And I'm going to write a song for her. I was five months pregnant when I wrote the song. Um, I had been working with Soul Shock and Carlin, my guys, um, for like almost a week and a half, I believe. Maybe even two weeks off and on. Um, but I knew I had worked with them several times. And they, I was just kicking out so many mm-hmm. songs. And I'll never forget how that song came about. Because, like I said, I was five months pregnant. I had... Uh, I married my college sweetheart and I was like about to step into this whole realm of like being a mom and, you know, all this new responsibility, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, I always try to remain childlike and fun Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. So I really was kind of afraid, but still excited, you know, Mm because it's like, oh, I got a baby, you know, come in, Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be a mom. But it was just a it was just a lot of different emotions going on. So for the for that week of writing, I was really trying to do my best because I didn't really know how much downtime I was gonna need. You know, once you become a mother, That's your right. life changes. It so changes. I think I wrote maybe like twelve songs that week. And on my way out, Carlin was like, Hey, I got this one idea that I've been building while you were while you were working and 
can you just try to like do something to it? And I'm just like, dude, I am exhausted. Man, I'm exhausted. <laughs> like I'm over here. I, I'm, I'm working for two people right now. Like, <laughs> right. And he was just like, just one more. Just give me like one more. So I remember calling uh, my uh cab or car service at the time and just letting them know. Because it wasn't Uber. Yeah, it definitely wasn't right. Uber back then. And I was like, uh, I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to be running a little bit late, but just, you know, if you could be out in the parking lot for mm-hmm. me, that'd be great. You know, I'm going to be on my way out. I literally wrote that song I promised in like 30 minutes. Mm. I just spit out the melody and the words just flowed. And then next thing you know, I'm getting a call from from them, from a solo shock and Carlin. They're like, we have this incredible idea. We're going to try to get this to Brandy. We found a singer who sounds just like her. And, you know, we know this is going to be a great song for her. You know, she was at that time, what we didn't know, there was a lot going on with, the, I think there was a car wreck or something mm. that happened. But I think the timing of it was all bad. Mm. But I tell that story because she's still my girl. Okay. She is the incredible Brandy. Incredible Brandy. Okay. So everybody got to pay respects. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, long short, um, I was excited and I thought that, you know, that was the demo was great because my demo was in my voice. Mm. I have more of a softer tone, like maybe like a Sierra ish mm. type vibe. Um, Aaliyah, you know, mm. grew up on Aaliyah. So mm. I, I was in that vein. And so my voice obviously is more softer and sweeter, whereas Brandy has more of a a a, a, a rasp, mm-hmm. you know, but it's still very you know, it's, it's full of texture, right. you know, and then of course she can do all the runs, you know, right. the Kimber Rail runs. Okay. Right. Oh, Shout yes. out to oh, Kim, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the queen. So, um, uh, and Whitney, of course. And so, uh, but yeah, Brandy was like, she was, like I said, that was what we were aiming for. So that's why they got another demoer to mm. perform it in that tone, mm. but that didn't work out. And we were kind of like, well, what are we going to do now? Because, you know, she's not going to be able to do it. And I remember getting a call from Big John and he told me that uh, Ron Fair heard the song, heard the Mm -hmm. demo and was like, this is going to be Keisha's last song before her album drops. We're going to put this on the album. I'm going to bring in an orchestra. Um, We're going to take it to the next level. And that's exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. Um, Keisha contributed to the, the bridge beautiful bridge um it had a whole musical transition when bridges were popular when okay we had bridges yeah when we had bridges right. and uh it was just an incredible piece uh so if y'all i've had so many people say oh my god i didn't know you wrote this song it's one of my favorite songs if y'all haven't heard falling out go listen to it it was inc- it was perfectly it was produced perfectly mm. and i was very proud of it um once i heard the final um and and so that went on to also go platinum the, the whitney houston album went platinum um keisha cole's mm-hmm. album got nominated for a grammy and also went platinum as well mm-hmm. and so i was just like oh my god and now i got a baby in my tummy and i'm about to be a mom <laughs> and you know so yeah that transitioned into me writing again more you know writing more songs and being sought out even more now the demand is there and i'm like i got right. a baby now so we got a studio in our home and you know it's it's like daycare and mm-hmm. <laughs> I got her. On, I got her on my. Daycare, you know, right. she's in my in my lap, and I'm writing and performing, and I mean, not performing, uh, recording, engineering. I'm doing it all, mm. and um, and so that's that was for that first five years, um, of my daughter's life. We we were there in that place of you know I would travel every now and then and go still go to the conferences and things like that, but obviously not as much, mm-hmm. um, in the studios all over the country. You know, I had to be at home and just, you know, making sure, yeah, making sure, you know, I was a wife and, you know, making sure that, you know, was taken care of and, you know, you got more family now to tend to. And so it was just, it was an incredible ride. It was a journey. Um, We decided to part ways. We're great friends now, have a great co-parenting relationship. Mm -hmm. He's gone on, got married. You know, I'm in a healthy relationship as well myself. Um, And, you know, we're just all cool. It's, it's, cool. it's we have incredible kids and everybody mm-hmm. chips in and great partnership and um I moved back to Atlanta in 2013 and I didn't even tell you I forgot that when I was those five years mm-hmm. I was looking at the royalties mm. and that was right around the time because this is very important so I, I don't want to leave this out about 2008 2009 you remember that time what was mm-hmm. going on in the economy. <sighs> 
What wasn't going on in the economy? It probably was. It was this the recession time this that we were was all, the recession. that we all faced with, and we were trying to figure out how we're going to Be. going to survive and you know get you money. You remember from all those and, houses that were like? I guess people had had those adjusted adjustable so, yeah, interest yeah, rates and stuff. You know what was so crazy about it is that they have my wife and I saw a movie. I can't remember the name of the movie. There were two movies that we saw about the housing bubble yeah. and what ended up causing this whole recession and how they, the government knew that this recession was happening, that yes. the housing bubble had collapsed and the, the, the economy was crashing Yes, and just all the, I got to get the, the movies were, Oh my gosh. Like they really showed you that they knew that it was that a recession, was a recession. But, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. But that recession caused a lot of things to happen. During that time, I think within a couple of, I think around that time was when LimeWire and Napster, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, they destroyed the industry <clears throat> single-handedly. They destroyed it. Like broke it down. They broke it down. They did. And now you have all this file sharing mm-hmm. and MP3 files, and you know, of course, we're new to email. Oh, we have and- the same thing we have today, then, just in a different format. Oh my god! So we'll get there. And I was like, okay, so what? What's going on with these checks? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because the, of course right. you had your you got you have your publishing coming in, but now we have a new way that people are consuming music, mm-hmm. and so we could already tell at least at least by 2011, I could start seeing that there were like these distribution companies mm-hmm. popping up, and you were just really trying to understand how it worked. I was still working on. I wanted to try it one more time for a solo scent, you know, just to like put out a project. So I even produced, you know, my own uh, independent uh, project again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like a, similar to what I did in, in, in college. And I was like, I want to give it a go one more time, you know, and, and I'm my own label now. I'm my own songwriter. And people were looking at me like, I mean, my own artist and people looking at me like, girl, you just, you still trying to be an artist and all that. And I was like, I mean, why not? You know, let's just give it a go one more time. And, and so I was able to craft a full compilation project. Um, but I also was like, I need some more money because Things were kind of <laughs> right. like, you know, bills are due every month. Mm-hmm. You know, royalty checks come quarterly. And, you know, depending on, you know, what it is you, you from your bigger publisher, you you know, would get paid, you know, like your international royalty and stuff that'll come in like, you know, twice a year. You mm-hmm. know, those mechanicals. Um, and it, it it started being like, you know, I got a lot of responsibility now. So this is why I say listen to your mama. OK, listen to your mama, because that degree that I got from TSU, I was able to a- obtain a job working at Radio One. Um, they did not have a digital division at the time, mm. and the world was evolving into the blogging space. And so, of course, it was going around the city that I knew how to like do websites mm. and all that type of stuff. And I was partnering with one of my guys, uh, Orbit, who... Um, is an incredible videographer and producer, um, cinematographer and all that. Back then, back in the day, we were like doing all the promotional parties. We were sending mm-hmm. photographers out, designing their flyers, putting it on our website, like making it like an entertainment space where people mm-hmm. would come back and like check their photos and see what's, you oh, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know how it is. Right, you go right. to the club yeah, and take yeah. a photo and then you come back and like download it from off of whatever photographer's page or whatever. And we had models and all kinds of stuff. I was always creative. So that's just kind of like side stuff just mm. to be have fun. It wasn't like I was like trying to create a media company. Really right. didn't know the potential of it at the time. But these are my friends. We're all in media. I'm a songwriter too. Mm. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. It was just something to kind of keep the creativity going mm. because obviously I'm not in the studio every day, every night, like I was prior. Right. And so that ended up turning into a job opportunity to where it was like, hey, uh, you know, got a phone call. Hey, we need someone to run our websites at the radio station. Do you mind, you know, coming mm. and doing an interview? And I mean, I was there talking the whole, the GM, I talked to him under the table. I was talking about ad space on the website <laughs> like, and how we can like craft out, you know, where things are supposed to move. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from a marketing standpoint, just really implementing everything that I had learned, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, and my girl, Danny, she even taught me how to work in Ju- at Joomla. I don't know if you remember yeah, Joomla. Joomla. So we yeah. had Words, WordPress, WordPress and Joomla, Joomla. and yep. all these other little CMSs and stuff. So yeah. I'm a nerd, you know. I I love this. I build websites stuff. too. Exactly, right? exactly. So, yeah, it's like it's like the thing to know how to do, right? Mm-hmm. So, I use that 
and got me some sal- some salaries c- kicking in, some health insurance oh, yeah. and all that stuff, you know, and I was able to build the Houston market. Um, we became consecutive in, you know, um, driving Internet traffic to the radio station's websites. And then wow. it went on to Dallas and then St. Louis. And next thing you know, we had a conglomerate of just mm-hmm. all these different markets of online editors. And then I became a regional online editor where I was over wow. other online editors. So all this is like just to kind of keep me focused and keep that money coming in because we're in a recession Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's kind of confusing right now Mm -hmm. with the music industry. And at the time, the industry was trying to catch up with LimeWire and Napster and like trying to figure out what, you know, all these labels were suing them. And so it was just really quiet. It was a quiet Mm -hmm. time. And so I'm so grateful for having that that degree because that allowed me to be able to articulate myself in a way that showed that I was really educated about what I knew, what was going Mm -hmm. on. Um, And I landed that job. And um, then next thing you know, after five years, um, when I decided to move back to Atlanta, I told my manager in New York, I was like, Sam, I don't think I'm going to be able to stay with the company because I'm trying to get back to Atlanta. Um, I really want to focus back on my music and Mm -hmm. all that. And he was like, girl, you can't leave us. Like, (laughs) it was like, like, look, I got a position in Atlanta for you. Mm. You know, Ricky Smiley is looking for someone to help Mm. with the digital locally. And, um, and so I'm going to place you with that. And I'm also going to give you a promotion. And so I got a raise. Oh, okay. I was like, God is like working because I just was, I was just stepping out on faith and, you know, making the transition because I knew I needed to be back in Mm. Atlanta and, uh, Atlanta had always felt like home to me. There were times where people would do articles on me and for some weird reason, it would always say that Atlanta was my hometown and it was an error. It was not true. Wow. And I would have to go back and tell the editor, hey, you, y'all you put Atlanta as my hometown. I am from Houston. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I want to rep my hood, rep, yeah. my, rep, rep, my, rep my city, my hometown, my mm-hmm. hood, you know. And so I but every time I came to Atlanta, I had so many great relationships and I got so much work done and. It was just where everybody was, you know, it was just, I felt like this is where I belong. This is home. Yeah, this is home. So um, upon letting my manager know that I was moving back, you know, that's when he, you know, told me about what he wanted to do Mm. with um, Ricky and the syndicated show and just kind of really give them an online digital presence on Facebook and, you know, having a full blown out website. You know what? uh, I know Tammy's over here saying a whole bunch of stuff about radio and ads and (laughs) And stuff, right? Uh, you, you do consultation, Tammy. I'm gonna need some <laughs> consult. I'm gonna need some consultation over here. Of you know what I'm saying? Because I, I mean, you know what I'm trying to do with with we create music TV. I, I, I mean, need some, I need some consultation. I need we some, will uh, sit down. We will sit down because sit down. literally, we grew his brand. I worked with the New York office. We were back and forth, exchanging ideas, and also implementing a lot of ideas mm. to really take the brand to a bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Um, Wiki bought me my first camera and then I was then able to hire camera, you know, people Mm -hmm. to come in as well at times when I couldn't because now I'm being promoted. I'm a manager. I'm a national producer. Now I have like all these different markets and I'm still in the studio because I'm back in Atlanta and I'm still writing songs. Right. Yeah. So it was a lot. I had a really, really tough schedule in the morning show. They get started really, really early. In the morning. In so the morning. Oh, um, I had a sitter. I had to hire a sitter mm-hmm. to like, you know, make sure my baby was taken care of and transitioned into school in Atlanta really well. It was a lot of, you know, just trying to figure it out, you know, but making sure I kept that conse- that consistent income coming mm-hmm. in. And I was happy about that. You know, I mm-hmm. had a lot of songwriting friends that were creators that were like, I don't even really have a lot of skill set to even get back into trying to work a job, wow. but it's something I need to do. Do you have any ideas, you know? And so I'm just so grateful that I still had additional skill sets to be able to implement mm-hmm. um, because you just never know when you may have, you may need something to fall back on. And so that, that's what happened. So, so, so now I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> so, so, so let me ask you this then. How important is it for someone to develop skill sets out of uh, separate from the creative space in this day and age it is very important because how especially how we consume music and entertainment now you need to be able to 
stay in the game. Mm -hmm. You you have to be able to figure out if I ever need to pivot, what skill set do I have that I could use? You know, take some classes, mm -hmm. you know, YouTube University. Hello. Um, but there are a lot of classes out there. There are a lot of skill sets that people have naturally that they don't even think about that they can do. That's mm -hmm. why even when the pandemic hit, everybody was like blowing up with coming up with ideas and oh, business. Yeah. Like it was almost like you had no choice but to be creative and figure it out figure on it out. how you were going to, going to use what you had to get some income coming in right. some way, somehow. So I would say during that time, that was like 2013, 14, 15, I was like, thankful for my degree because who would have thought that I would have needed to fall mm -hmm. back on it. Now I'm the national producer for interactive one slash radio one, you know, working wow. with the digital brands. And at that time it was all the markets now. So it was like 12 different markets mm -hmm. and each market has three websites that's connected to three to four websites, depending on how many radio stations mm -hmm. are in that market. Every radio station has a website and they have jocks and you have to, while mm -hmm. they're playing the music, you're letting them know what they need to talk about next on their break because Jay-Z and Beyonce just like boarded a yacht to some mm -hmm. exotic island or maybe Kanye was in the news about something controversial mm -hmm. and it needs to go up because it's breaking news. Right. You know, so it was all of, I was in the space of music because of course it's radio, but it was also about content management and being able to train and develop a team of content mm -hmm. creators as well as online editors. We didn't, the term content creator wasn't even a word. It was not. Yet. It was not yet. Not even influencer, you know? So, um, but in a corporate space, a corporate setting, you know, the jocks were mm -hmm. the, they were the new digital personalities mm -hmm. because everyone already knew their voice. So now it's time to have a camera in front of them, you know? Wow. So we were, we were very integral with making sure that, that was done. And, um, and like I said, I would do that during the day. Right. I would get my daughter from school, you know, make sure I'm with her for a couple of hours, get dinner ready, uh, get, you know, her homework and everything mm -hmm. completed and make sure she's in bed by eight. And I'm at the studio, the sitter just got there and I'm at the studio by 10 o'clock and I probably won't leave until about two, three in the morning Wow. and do it all over again. And do it all over again. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's what people don't understand is that it's 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 a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're still holding down a full time job and still are being creative and you still have a family. Right. Yeah. And, and I think for for you and I think for most creatives, even for myself, it's prioritizing and making sure that, you know, OK, I, I do this segment in this period of time, but I still need to make time for family. I'm big and, on segmenting, by the way. So I'm yeah, glad you yeah, said yeah. that. Yeah. And then, you know. From here, then I need to make sure that this area is taken care of so then I can do this, do this one without, you know, with minimal interruption. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't uh, understand is because they're so um, scatterbrained in a lot of different areas. You have to be uh, able to compartmentalize. You got to compartmentalize. Yeah. You got you to gotta be able to segment things off in a way that is healthy, that allows you to focus your energies and time in those particular areas. So that you're able to function in the other areas that you want to. Absolutely. Um, a lot of discipline. Not lots. Schedule. I could not get off of the schedule. Mm. Um, from <clears throat> the time that I spent with my daughter, just bonding, mm. you know, play dates on the weekends, sleeping in on the weekends. Um, and just really making that time to do nothing because I knew as soon as Monday hit, like literally on Sundays at 6 p.m., I would be planning out my week. See, planning out the week. And making sure I that, that I had everything in line, making sure that I knew what she had going on with her mm -hmm. schedule because she was very active as well in athletics. We had already started making sure she was um, participating in sports. And, you know, and, you know, I didn't really, I wouldn't really say I had a whole bunch of girlfriend time, you know, just hanging out and doing that. Because... I was still new. So mm -hmm. my community was other single moms like mm -hmm. me. So we would do carpooling and things like that. And kind of like, you know, right. maybe she'll single go on a date. Things. Yeah. yeah <laughs> right. She'll go on a date and she'll drop her kids <laughs> off. off. You know, right. we kind of rotate and do things like that. But I, I really didn't have a lot of like girls night out type, mm -hmm. you know, stuff because I just really wanted to 
to maximize the time. Mm. So even if I'm at home and I could be out like at a club or something like that, I really was like, I need to work on this song. Mm. You know, I need to work on this idea or, you know, there was always something to do that mm. was a bit more productive. And I just always have chosen the latter. You know? I love that. And I think that's a component that is missing, especially today. Now, I don't want to say it, it impacts everyone, right? but there are people who you can tell what they really want to be in by where they spend most of their time. Absolutely. Right. And so you have people who's like, well, yeah, I'm at the club again. Like, yeah, but you know, what, what about the, the song you're supposed to be writing or the album you're supposed to be dropping or the studio session you're supposed to be in. And, and once again, right. <laughs> priorities. Once it, it's, it's all about priorities, right? It's all about pro- priorities. It's all about boundaries. What are you allow to come into your space? What are you allowed to take up, you know, your time, your energy? And I think that's what, because I, and it's always that I know where people truly want to be mm-hmm. by where they spend a lot of their time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Whew, yeah, it was definitely a time for me. I, um, I really had just, I, I really overworked mm-hmm. myself to the point to where I had a bit of, I had a bit of, I had, I had already been diagnosed with anxiety panic disorder in 2012. Mm. Um, I don't really talk about it as much because I've been able to like maintain mm-hmm. and manage it for quite some time. But my therapist talked to me and was like, you know, you operated a very high um, place of energy mm-hmm. and product productivity than the average person Mm -hmm. because you have your brain is operating in so many different areas at so at at the same time Mm -hmm. you you got all these things probably at a rapid pace at a rapid pace because you're having to think you know from so many different perspectives Mm -hmm. you have to be a creator you have to be a manager you have to be a mom you have to Mm -hmm. be who you are (laughs) authentically you know just a human (laughs) you know but being in that mode of having to make decisions for so many different people because you manage a full team Mm -hmm. and then you have a manager above you that you still have to, you know, report to Mm -hmm. and things like that. It really put me in a place of like, just kind of my body just shut down one time and I just literally felt paralyzed for like two days. And that's when the diagnosis came and I was like, Oh wow, this really exists, you know? Mm -hmm. So by the time I got to Atlanta, I had been managing it, you know, from that point on. It's just certain things. I had to change my my diet, my eating habits. Mm. I had to work out more. So now I'm adding fitness to the equation, a fitness you gotta, schedule. And you got to put that in your schedule. You got to put that in the schedule as well. Right. You know, I changed a lot of my foods. I wasn't drinking as much. Mm. Um, I don't drink at all now, no alcohol at all. Um, and, and I really just kind of changed the way I did things so that I could function at a higher capacity and and be optimal Mm -hmm. right that was really important to me but I started seeing that it was also starting to break me down you know and so um I love the corporate setting I didn't too much particularly care for like the antics in corporate and politics the politics of it all red tape and all the things you gotta and just things you have to deal with you know you know just because some people lack integrity I'm not saying I dealt with a lot of that, but there was a lot, exist. there were, there were things that were going on that I didn't want to associate myself with. Um, and it also made me uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to part ways, um, with, um, radio one Atlanta and, uh, and, you know, I still have great friendships, um, from that relationship and, you know, still cool with a lot of the radio one family, interactive one family, but I just felt like it was time to move on. Mm. And I also wanted to take a stab at what I initially came out there for was to work on music full time. Mm-hmm. Just remember, I was trying to quit mm-hmm. in 2012. And it was like, well, it's 2013 before I actually moved there in April. And it was like, no, you can't quit. It was like, I'm, look, I, I got you now. I got a job for you. Right. You know, I'm going to promote you. And all. it's just like, okay, okay. But now I'm like, okay, I did my run. I'm ready to quit. And so I, um, you know, just started like doing all these little side jobs again. I started doing mobile apps. I started doing websites. I started. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to do some conversations. Oh, here. man, I started doing so much. I was like, I just got to figure it out. And now I'm working full time 
in business, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm an entrepreneur now. So I, I need to study how to be an entrepreneur, you know, and I was able to do that, um, work with some incredible people to kind of mentor me along the way. Um, I never forget this uh, young lady that I was working with um, that I was introduced to. Her and her husband had a real estate. No, they had a tax business at the time. They hadn't mm. yet gotten into fully real estate. And she was like, you just need to write your termination letter and just your resignation letter. She's like, you need right. to write your resignation letter. Write and I know you haven't turned it in yet, but just write it. Just, just write it. Just write it. Just write, write it. it. And I was like, all, my mind was already out the door. I'm mm -hmm. helping to grow, to grow social media accounts. You know, I'm, I'm working with like independent brands mm -hmm. and doing their websites and making sure they have great sales and all this type of stuff. I'm in that world in the day, during the daytime. I'm at the studio at night and and I'm doing YouTubes. I'm on. I'm. Mm -hmm. I'm doing YouTube videos before mm -hmm. it became a thing. Before we had partnership deals and all that type right. of stuff. And I'm talking about the business of music and things like that. And next thing you know, about 2018, I get a DM from someone. Uh, one of my. He's one of still one of my clients to this day. Who's like, Hey, I saw your video on YouTube about unclaimed royalties. I think I have some missing money out there. Mm. And so that was the beginning of what came to be Mezzo mm. because I ended up finding out that he had $80,000 in unclaimed money that he had not 80 grand, 80 grand, 80 grand. That was unclaimed. unclaimed. You know, obviously we don't know how much is there when we're right. going after it, but it was definitely sitting there. You know, he produced some incredible work on Queen Naja's album. Mm. She was like the YouTube sensation, mm -hmm. social media sensation mm -hmm. at the time was very popular. Her albums were going platinum. Um, I think that album, yeah, and those two singles that he produced went platinum. Wow. So it was like, oh, my God. And he was like, look, I know you don't know me. I'm a kid in New Jersey. I just need help. Can you manage me? And I was like, ooh, ooh. I don't know. <laughs> Manage? Management? Management, is, it takes a whole lot <laughs> Sounds like to a, be a manager. Yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, let's do an agreement where I will help you go after your unclaimed money. And at that time, of course, I know a lot about publishing mm -hmm. because, you know, exactly. I'm, I'm in the publishing game, you know, as exactly. a songwriter. But I had to kind of turn on the behind the scenes business side of publishing mm. because now I'm becoming an administrator. Right. I'm like registering his songs, you know, uh, doing revisions, uh, reaching out to other pay sources, trying to figure out you know, when can we be expecting? But mm -hmm. I had to have all the documentation to allow me and the authority to do right. that. You know, so like, that's when like I who started is she trying to get all this money. We don't oh, know who this man. is. It was, it was, it was crazy. So uh there was a company um that was in New York at the time that sought me out and wanted me to be a brand ambassador. And um I started off being a brand ambassador with them. I did a couple of interviews, just kind of introducing the world to the to publishing administration. Mm -hmm. And um those videos went really they did really well on my YouTube channel. And I'm not doing as many websites anymore because now I have more clients that are coming to me, like, hey, can you help me find my money? Mm -hmm. Find my money, find my money. And so now I have about five clients that I'm, you know, going after royalties on. I'm like, oh my God, I got a business. This is it. This like, is business. you know, my first client, Hefe, like he he really like helped me to see that this is what I could do um, because we were finding the money and he was getting paid mm. and I was getting my commission and all that. But, you know, it, it takes time for that money to come in. So this was not something that like, you know, get rich quick scheme. Right. Like I still had to pay bills in between. So I'm not doing it as much anymore as far as like writing. I mean, uh, working on websites. Uh, and songwriting as much mm -hmm. I'm now like diving into books and like you know mm -hmm. watching all these videos on you know how to do this and how to do that and things to look out for and you know just really immersing my world into the behind the scenes and even taking my mind back to when I was a full-time songwriter going to the Santa Monica office understanding each division it you mm -hmm. know at EMI understanding the licensing department and what they do and understanding, you know, what creative does, mm -hmm. you know, and really seeing what those, you know, different parts are and operationally how they all come together, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I was like, Lord, I have a business. I didn't have a name yet, but I have a business and I need help. 
you know, and so I just started thinking about, well, who am I to my clients? I am the in-between, the money and the writer. So I'm like in the middle, you know, and then how could we like kind of put that all together to make it make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, is it going to be consulting? Is it going to be? And I'm like, well, no, I work with different facets of the business because I work with the PROs and I'm working with the record labels and I'm working with, you know, these different territories and and all these different societies and now we got all these apps and like they have to pay out so many things now royalties and licenses right. and then youtube so this is like an agency yeah you know because we work with so many different people and then i was like okay so i know it's probably going to be an agency i'm doing everything by myself i'm literally i have a bedroom and my computer and i'm like building the business wow. from scratch like every single day just drilling at it wow. i had moved my mom in town um and had her transition to Atlanta from Houston to have that additional support for my daughter because she's getting older and she's a junior Olympian right. now. And it's just a lot of demand. Mm-hmm. Um, and next thing you know, I got more clients and more clients and, and I'm like, Oh my Working God. I, yeah. So that's how Mezzo came about. And I chose Mezzo because of course it reminds you of Mezzo, like music, mm. like Mezzo Forte, mm-hmm. Mezzo Soprano, but where is Mezzo? Where does that mean? The middle, the middle. And so, right. praise God. Thank you, God. Thank Man, you, Lord. That. And so, that's how Mezzo was founded. That's mm. how it all came together. And I may be off with, like, how, you know, the timing of everything. Right. But overall, that's how it came about. And, um, you know, we've just, we've just been, we've been killing They've it. They've been crushing it. We've been crushing They've it. They've been crushing it. We actually, it. as of September 2023, we have found claimed matched and distributed out over a million dollars in unclaimed royalties wow so I, and, i'm so proud and they're just sitting out there yeah in some box hovering in some just waiting. places yeah for people to for people to claim them but claim you them. have to have the right paperwork you have to have the right person's uh business mm-hmm. uh What's um and, and and language in mm. place to understand because publishing, you know, it's a lot of acronym talk, um, and it's a lot of agreement talk, and you got to know your dates, and you have to know, of course, how to manage a catalog, right. and and so I immersed myself into that world, and I walked away from everything else. I I let go all of my social media clients, I let go all mm. of my website clients, and became full time in music. Wow. administration the back end side of it the not so sexy part of the music business but very important any regrets no um no and the reason why i say that is because where i am today mm-hmm. um if i made any regrets then that would be kind of like not being appreciative of mm-hmm. the journey that i took cuz it was hard mm, it, i'm sure. not going to i I would be lying if I said, oh, we just found this money. I mean, you got to think about it. I only make 15% of what my clients make. So if they make $100, I'm only getting $15. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. I definitely was not doing it for the money. I was doing it because as an advocate and understanding all the complexities and challenges that songwriters and producers mm-hmm. go through, they needed help. And I didn't see people of my skin yeah. tone that yeah. were really out there you know, waving a white flag, like, hey, 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 mm-hmm. we got to look out for each other. So I just decided to join and be a part of that movement and being a member of the Recording Academy. I'm now the vice president of the Recording Academy Atlanta chapter. And this is my but second year. Just two year. terms. Just two terms right here. Yeah, two terms. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And um, and so, you know, that's a part of advocacy has always been a part of that because that was the Music Modernization Act, mm-hmm. you know, that passed in 2018. You know, so that was a part of my efforts, just going to the meetings, showing up, making sure I'm participating in advocacy workshops and events where we have to speak with lobbyists and, you know, congressmen and all that stuff. So um, I got a chance to meet uh, the late, great John Lewis. Amazing person. You know, person. he was a part of supporting the bill for us. That's right. So it was it was really incredible, incredible, incredible experience. And it kind of melded everything together. So mm. to answer your question, no regrets. No regrets. Do you think the situation in the beginning with the um, the song for Whitney Houston kind of was the the spark, the underlining spark that eventually led you into founding the Mezzo Agency? I think that God knew exactly where I was going to be today. And so he had to have everything mm. lay out in the exact order that it did 
to make me understand the importance of protecting my rights. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it was already to me destined um, for me to do the work that I do today. Yeah, yeah I, I find that, I find that interesting is that certain things that may happen in the past are catalysts for things that we find ourselves participating 100%, in in the future. One hundred percent, because you know I was just doing what my mom said. You need to do mm -hmm. everything to protect yourself. But then when it when I realized I had to stand up for myself, and I always was the one that was the outspoken one at the label, mm -hmm. saying, "Hey, why are we doing this? And why is it not that? And why were we promised this, but we're not getting that?" You know, so that you know, being outspoken and like standing up for myself was never an issue. But at the same time, it was a skill that I needed to have to be able to fight for the rights of others. And so um, I, it, it to me was just a part of the foundation. Mm. Um, and definitely I can see how you could say, you know, that it could be the catalyst yeah, of yeah. it because you know, I've, of course, in between that time of the Whitney Houston placement, I've gone on to do so many different things, but I always, always wanted to make sure that my business was in order, you know, and it's been a journey. I, once I started seeing that Mezzo was growing, I was able to sign K Camp in 2020 um, and a few of his other writers and producers. And next thing you know, I just have all these incredible gospel mm -hmm. writers and producers behind the scenes who've been written some of the classics that we've grown up listening to. I started making sure that from a business standpoint, things were in order so that as the company grew and I knew I would have to hire more people, mm -hmm. that everything was organized so that I could just put people in place and started creating all those systems, right. SOPs, um, just making sure we had automation by mm -hmm. 2021 the end of 2021, because, um, of course, we're working through the pandemic now, right. right? The pandemic is hit, but now everybody is rushing online, and I'm doing these online workshops mm -hmm. every Friday at 8 o'clock going live on Instagram mm -hmm. talking about the business, which I think is how we yeah. got acquainted, yeah. right? Yep. And so then it's like, okay, organization, because now you got more people coming to you. You need to hire more people, and I was able to start hiring, and I—, I Decided to go into a partnership. The partnership didn't work. We just were not on the same page. Mm. Um, I really didn't really understand a lot of, you know, contribution wise, because I was doing so much on my own, mm. even though there was money and things there. But, you know, we just decided to part our sep to go our separate ways. You know, we paid I paid my 33 and a third and everything. And then we were able to just, you know, right. just kind of break away from everything. But I ended up having to take the brunt of you know, all of the rent and all of this and all of that, you know, once people leave and, you know, you're just left with trying to pick up the pieces mm -hmm. and it was fine. Cause I was like, Hey, I started the business on my own anyway. It, the partnership didn't work. It's all good. No love lost. See you. Hey, how you doing? I hope right. all is well. Um, but I was able to move on and, um, started hiring a team. And thankfully I had the automation, the systems, the operations already in line. Mm -hmm. And then I was chosen to be a part of Goldman Sachs's, 10,000 businesses program. Yeah, I know. And that's when it was like, oh, oh my God. This is. I didn't know nothing about nothing. <laughs> 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 you know, because now I'm around all these, I'm talking about business experts, moguls. I'm sitting with so many people in mm -hmm. class who have like made millions mm -hmm. and millions of dollars. And I'm in class every day for a year learning how to build a business from the ground up, from everything. So what I thought I learned wow. at TSU, that was, like I said, foundational. But this was intense. And I was working. We had an office um, off of uh, Ellsworth Industrial. Then we moved to Peachtree. And mm -hmm. I'm in class four days out of the week at my office while I'm in between work. Wow. You know, and my assistant... My operations manager, everybody's kind of coming in and like, hey, you got class in like 15 minutes, so you're going to have to wrap up that call. You know, just really mm -hmm. making sure I stayed on schedule. Then I had to pick up my daughter from school, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like an hour away, you know. So it was a lot of just making sure that everything that I had, that schedule, that discipline, that just all of that, I literally evolved into an executive like within three, three years. Mm. And it was intense. Mm -hmm. And but it was the most incredible experience. I graduated from there um, in 2022, 2022, 2023, I believe, from New York. I can't remember the, the years, but 
you can go to my Instagram. You'll see. It's it was either there. 2022 or 2023. I think I started in 2022 and then graduated in 2023. Um, and then from from that, I also, um, I forgot to mention, I got my certification in copyright law from Harvard. Mm. And that was also, it was a very intense international global type program that immersed me into the world of understanding intellectual property. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to be an attorney, but I changed my mind <laughs> after kind of realizing that the work that I do, it doesn't require mm -hmm. me to be an attorney. Mm -hmm. I can work and collaborate with attorneys, but a lot of them need my services okay. because they are not sense. so... You know, they're not granular when it comes down to registrations and collections and distributions. They really want to focus on contractual, transactional type of uh, processes. And I respect that, but I'm really intense when it comes down to like organization and uh, finding money mm -hmm. and doing the research and things like that. So I went to law school for two years, but I was like, nah, I'm cool <laughs> on it, you know. And just talking to some of my, my lawyer colleagues, they were like, girl. Like you are doing it like if you want to do it, cool, but you're doing it already, right. you know. So that's that's ultimately how I, you know, evolved into where I am now. I once I saw that I had the business since I still wanted to make sure I educated myself by going back to school. I'm a look, I will go back to school. She's like, okay? I'll go back to school. Look. I don't mind. She, she like, I'm not a stranger to, to education. No, because it's knowledge. so important. You you need to know the intricacies of the business. It's mm. so many people that have businesses but don't know how to run mm. their businesses, and that is very vital. And I think that's I think that's probably one of the biggest issues I see with the term entrepreneur. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Is you have a lot of people who have businesses but don't know how to run the business. And sustain the business. Right. They don't understand processes, systems, systems. SOPs. They like SOP. Somebody's going to watch this and go, what's, what's the SOP? What's the standard operating procedure? Man. Like, y'all look it up. Know, what's the work process, right? Like yeah. how do you, how do you start to develop the back end well enough so that it can automate and maintain itself? Automation, and marketing. Run, yeah. Right? And then auditing your company. Like we, every quarter, like we not only audit our own clients mm. to make sure that, you know, they have everything in place and all their songs, like all of my clients will receive an, uh, an email from one of our reps at the company to say, hey, we're just checking in. We noticed that you have a couple of singles out, but, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have the registrations on that. We have our forms set up to where when they do have registrations, they can put those in. It automates and sends to our registration team. Like I have a full spectrum of a company that several different departments that manage you know all of the facets of publishing to make right. sure that even when I'm asleep business is being handled even right. when I'm out traveling on vacation doing whatever with family that the company is still running right. and and it took time but it 100% got me to a place now to where we're about to revamp and do a whole nother marketing, um, you know, campaign and, you know, some of the things that we w that we did that helped bring us where we needed mm -hmm. to be to start really gathering a lot of clients. Now we're ready to go to the next level of what that is. And and I, and I love the fact that we're a boutique agency because it doesn't make the pressure as heavy, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but at the same time. It really allows me to be able to um see the growth and then also dream a little bit bigger right you know because i know where we come from right and and so that has been helpful with um you know the team and how i want the team to evolve and um how i want us to grow and you know i i'm always down for hiring our own and minorities and i got mm -hmm. certified as a, my, a woman owned small business with the sba um, and started really tapping into mm -hmm. a, a lot of those resources as well to sustain the company. And I mean, in the beginning, there were times I didn't even take a salary, you know, for a mm -hmm. couple of years just to make sure my staff got paid and that they had what they need because it was just a growing right. business, you know. Um, and thankfully, I had investments and just other things outside of Mezzo because this is more of a passion project for me. This mm -hmm. is not something where I'm just like, this is my bread and butter. This is the only thing I have going on. I have right. several other things going on um that allowed me to kind of stay afloat you know but not once did my dedication waver not once did my discipline waver 
I wanted to make sure that, you know, my staff felt like they can reach out, um, open door policy, Mm -hmm. um, and also learn at the same time, because I'm still learning. I'm learning how to run Mm -hmm. the business. And it was kind of lonely, you know. Um, And then even my clients, just making sure they felt comfortable and connected with me. Having those one-on-ones, you know, hey, you know, what are you guys working on? How's everything going? Let me get the number to the people you're having a dispute with. We can solve mm-hmm. that for you. We can take care of this. Customer service is top notch. We're yeah. five stars for a reason. That's right. You know, on Google. So that that was all important to me. And so now we're we're in a revamp stage, a phase stage, um, where, you know, we're gonna be taking things to the next level. 2025, 26 is gonna be like mm-hmm. incredible for us. Um, and and I've had to do some consolidation, you know, mm-hmm. with the company as far as like, you know, our team, but now the productivity has increased. So we scaled and then um kind of down we downsized first in order to scale. Mm. You know, became and became a little more lean. Became a little bit more lean. Um so that you can scale appropriately. Oh my God. Yeah. And and so that has helped us, but now we're like going into like that that third phase, mm. you know, of like of you know, scaling in a major way to where now I'm just I'm I'm gonna be just fa- the founder, right? You know, and I'm I'm hiring some superstar people that are c- coming in that are well versed in the industry mm-hmm. that are gonna be you know really helping to take the company to the next level. So what um, what part do you see AI having in the future of your operations? Oh, it's already a part of my operations. The automation that we have. Um, from our newsletters that are being generated that go out every month to a lot of the copy, social media copy that we do um, to a lot of the accounting um, mm-hmm. that we do um, with with our uh, bookkeeper and our accountant, um, our CPA, just making sure that certain things, certain rules and behaviors from our spending and our budgeting, mm-hmm. as well as uh, commissions and all that, and making sure we have savings and all that for a rainy day. You just never right. know. Never I know. wasn't even thinking about that, you know, in the beginning because I'm just trying to get my clients paid. But now it's like, well, in order for you to grow, you still have to be able to take a portion of your commissions and make sure that is put aside for savings and investment for the business. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't thinking like that, you know, mm-hmm. in 2019, you know, 18, 19, 20, mm-hmm. you know, but now that's where my mind is now. It's like, Oh, so that's how these labels and publishers, the major ones, that's how they're surviving. They're Mm -hmm. actually, you know, investing their commission, their money. Um, And then a lot of them have ownership. You know, we don't take ownership for any of our writer's songs. They own their songs, their copyrights at 100 percent. But a lot of those publishing companies take ownership. And then um, and then I learned from just working with so many different private equity firms and how their mind is, you know, they're buying Mm -hmm. up catalogs now, but they don't have administration. They are buying up cat. They are buying up catalogs. So they're owners with no operations, you know. So of course they're consulting mm-hmm. with us on assisting them with making sure that catalogs are being managed, and mm-hmm. um, you know, and that licenses are being cleared, and that you know the writers and producers and publishers that are still owed money are still getting paid, you know, based on you know said agreements and LODs right. and things like that. So it's it's just been a whole nother level of it, and I'm so grateful to have. Uh, been able to experience it from the ground up, you know, and then kind of, you know, be able to watch it all expand, Mm -hmm. but still be a part of that. You know, I look at, I kind of, I take myself out of my business and look at it from a, like from the outside looking in, because it helps me to be able to see like, oh, okay, I see how this is going. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when I did this and that, like, that's how my brain works. And then I put myself back into it and say, okay, this is what Right. This is what needs to happen next. This is right. how you're going to create your 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 organizational structure, and and this is how things need to run. Right. And this is what you're lacking, and this is what you need to do. So you have to save up money for this in order for that to work, because this is what's going to help mm-hmm. your songwriters and producers get paid faster. You know, um, be able to file claims in a more you know a quicker manner. Mm-hmm. Um, when disputes and resolu- when the disputes and conflicts come in, how quick are we going to be able to resolve it? Right. You know, how is that being documented? Are they are you making your writers and producers aware of all the PRO changes that's mm-hmm. going on and all the delays with, you know, royalties and everything that's going on with MLC and, you know, all the money that was on hold from all the, the streaming providers that right. got paid out and how that's going to be distributed out. Just making sure I'm sending out those emails mm-hmm. and keeping them educated and informed about what's going on with their money 
that's a part of sustaining the company. That's right. You know, not just the financial, you know, not just the marketing, but really still being an, a, a, a part of uh, their life and their processes of being creative, right. you know, and just letting them know what's, what's happening on the back end. You know, it's, it's interesting that as you're talking about being on the business side of it, mm-hmm. a lot of what you're talking about is applicable to the creative side. Mm-hmm. A lot of producers, artists don't really see themselves as business owners and, and they are business owners. The same things that you're talking about, about having operations and how you're structuring and organizing and scheduling and producing and, and executing is a hundred percent applicable to an artist or as a, or a producer. Yeah. Um, uh, and just trying to figure out how to how to apply or to for them to learn those same type of things mm-hmm. so that they are able to run their businesses effectively. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got a, a, I got one or two more questions to ask um, as we start to wrap up. So the, here's I'm very interested in, in this one. So for yourself as a prominent black woman executive, um, how do you address the issue of representation in the music industry? Um, you said there wasn't a lot of people who are, you know, you didn't see a lot of people with your skin tone mm-hmm. um, sitting at those levels. And I really only know a handful of black women executives that are in this space. So so how, how do you how do you deal with the issue of representation within the music industry from that from that perspective? I'm happy to be representing um us. There's not a lot of us, obviously, but what I don't get caught up on is trying to just make that about what it's about, Mm -hmm. you know, um, I understand you need to have certifications and things like that for a benefit. Like prime example, I was talking to some executives Thursday and they were like, you know, we have all this money and 25% of it has to go to small businesses and you know, another portion of that 25% has to go to minority owned businesses. So we need you to boom, 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 you Mm -hmm. know, follow through on this and that and that, because we know that, you know, you'll be able to qualify for all this money. And I'm like, oh, sure. No problem. I'll have this done. Certification checked off, whatever. But I don't let that be the driving force of why I'm doing this Mm -hmm. because ultimately we're all human. And we're having human experiences in the creative realm of songwriting, producing. Right. And that has, that, that's, I mean, there's no color. There's no color. It really isn't. So I do have majority of people of color on my roster, but I also have, I have white mm-hmm. clients. I have Hispanic clients. I have Indian clients um, as well. Um, and of course black, you know, like I was saying, and, and all, you know, they are all, you know, people of color. My staff is, is I have one European and Asian, a few Asians, I'm sorry. Cause they're, they're on the other side of the world, but <laughs> you know, quite a few Asians and I have, you know, a black and Hispanic, you know? And so, um, I just didn't want I, color is, is important to me, but I didn't want that to be it just it, to me. It's just a part of how we mm. need to operate because that's how the world is. The world is diverse. So you need to operate diverse. Mm. There's no reason why it should be all black mm. or it should be all Hispanic or it should be all, you know, um, right. Asian. It should just be everybody coming in to do a job to get the work done, mm. no matter what color we are. So if I just happen to hire a white person at my company, I'm not concerned about whether or not I'm meeting some DEI, you know, expectation, um, uh, you know, with the people of color and just making sure that, you know, they're kind of isolated and doing their thing. No, we're all working together to get the goal done, to get the productivity done. And I'll be quite honest. There have been times where I've had people that are of my skin tone that don't want to work. Okay. So that's what I was about to ask. That was a follow-up question right there. See, that was, I'm glad you said that because that was the follow-up question. Um, as far as far as being in being in Atlanta, mm-hmm. where that is the um, so I'll give you an example, right? Um, so when we first got here, my wife's a business owner; she's an entrepreneur. She knows all about everything you talk about systems, but right, that's what that's her thing. That's, yeah, right. I mean, it's mine too, but that's 
And so when she first got here, um, she does women own business workshops. Awesome. And, um, I need to link. Oh, her. yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. She's, <laughs> she's out there. Right. So um, y'all do need to link for sure. Um, but that was what she faced when she got here, because um, for the workshop, she was starting to put back together uh, and, and people would ask her, is this a black event? And she's like, well, what do you mean? This is a black event. Are you going to, is it only black people that you're going to have at this event? Or is it going to be multicultural? You're going to have white people, you know, Hispanics, Asians. She said, this is the world. God made the world. He made people of different ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds. It's open to everyone. Well, we sorry, we can't, we can't participate. It's like, oh, it was like a culture shock from moving from St. Louis to here. In St. Louis, everybody wants to work together. Yeah. Except if you went to the, a different high school. But. No, let me tell you. Let me let me make sure I'm saying this clear. I love Atlanta for the richness in the black mm-hmm. culture. It was definitely a culture shock for me to walk into the city. I mean, the um, the federal courts um, downtown mm-hmm. and um, to see so many judges that were black on the walls. I had never seen anything like that never in my life it. right? ever coming from Houston. We were the minority. Okay. And we were, you know, in our area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've always been the minority, but to come to a city where there was so much black culture, where we are the majority and all of us have businesses, you have attorneys mm-hmm. and dentists and, um, you know, uh, women in the beauty industry and people in the music industry and all, and we're all black. Don't get me wrong. I had a huge sense of pride. Mm -hmm. Okay. But bottom line, when it comes down to my business, I'm looking at who's actually doing. Who's competent. Who's actually competent. Who's, who's able to do the work and who's able to stay focused and who's able to follow through on Mm -hmm. tasks. Because at the end of the day, nobody is working as hard as me. You know why I know no one's working as hard as me is because I know every single position that is that that's being operated on because I did it all you had to first. Do it all. I had to do that's it right. all first. So, you know, it's not about just trying to be a black owned mm-hmm. business with all black people. Like, okay, that's great if that is your thing, but that is just not how I operate because that's not even how the world operates. We have to work together. together. We have to. And yes, if there is an opportunity where funding comes in and it benefits me because I am registered as a black owned, a woman owned small business or mm-hmm. minority owned small business, then of course, you know, I'm going to be able to apply for it and I qualify for it. But that's because of what our culture has faced with, you know, just being disenfranchised and things right. like that. I believe we are, we're owed that anyway, that that's what we should. That's a part of what not to get all, you know, there, cause I can't go there, but <laughs> you know, when you think about reparations mm-hmm. and all that stuff, we can go down a whole nother Whole another, another journey, but we're not journey with that. That's but I'm right. just saying, when you have done the work to establish yourself as a business, you're actually making income, you're filing taxes and you're paying taxes. OK, because I owe taxes now. OK, I, I, when, when you start profiting, now you owe. Yes, ma'am. And so, you know, when it comes down to it, I need all the help and support I can get for funding. Mm-hmm. So we have won grants. I have applied for grants. We got turned down. I've applied for loans. We received a few loans. We've paid off all our loans as of, as of 2023. That's um, right. You know, we have one, no, I'm lying. We have one more loan that we're working on paying off. Mm-hmm. But all those little small little loans that we pulled that, to like get the business up and running, those have been paid off. Um, so when it comes down to financial health, it's it's mm-hmm. looking good but it that didn't come from just me being all just black. Right. You know, I love who I am, but I also had to work and do business p- with people that were not of my color in order for me to that's get right. the funding. That is a part of that's the that's a part of what's owed to me for the work that I've put in. That's right. You see what I'm saying? I do. So I you know, and and I may ruffle a few feathers with this, but that is just my mentality okay. from my experience and for what I've done right. to establish the business in the way that it is. And no, it's not perfect. Yes, I'm an independent. I do not receive funding from any other record labels and publishers because that was a lot of things that was something that came up was mm-hmm. like, well, who's behind her? I know she's affiliated with Sony now because, you know, EMI mm-hmm. purchased, uh, I mean, Sony purchased EMI. EMI right. So they were like, well, is Big John funding her company? And, you know, is she really working mm-hmm. with, maybe Warner is behind her because she has all these relations. And I'm just like, no, 
Like, I literally got this from the ground up. I took my own investment money that I had, you know, and built this company. Like I said, I didn't even take a salary for years, you know. So make it make sense. Like, and like mm -hmm. I said, look at our commissions, right? Clearly, I'm not doing it for the money. This is really a passion project of mine that, you know, if you're not passionate as, as I am about this business, you just can't work with my company. Mm. It just is what it is. I want some people on the team who are understanding that this is a growing business. Right. So it's not going to be perfect. You know, there have been times where I've, I've had to make changes on the team just because there was just not an understanding of what we do and how things work on the back end. And I never want anyone to feel like, you know, we're trying to, you know, mm -hmm. like stifle them. If you want to go off and, and be great because maybe you realize this isn't what you want to do anymore, then go do that. Or, I, you know, I may have to let you go because we just are not aligned anymore, mm -hmm. you know. But my experience with running a business and actually getting the certification, knowing how to run a business and how to That's manage important. my budgets and how to create my systems and put things into place, like, I don't even look at, what you look like. I look right. at your performance. I look at how well you're able to follow through on tasks. Do you communicate properly? Mm -hmm. You know, are you, um, you know, timely with tasks? Because guess what? We run a chain. So from the time we sign a client and do onboarding, then moving over to the catalog and registration process, mm -hmm. that's like a whole seven to 10 week process mm -hmm. that, takes time and if we don't have everything we need because the onboarding wasn't done properly that slows up this time mm -hmm. and then we can't even get to the next phase of waiting to collect the money because we're still slow and behind throughout the registration process like it's a whole system mm -hmm. so i don't anything I that we do that is not timely that's not efficient um it affects when my clients get paid and that's a problem. That's a problem. So that's why I have yeah. to identify all the time. I'm always looking like, okay, this looks like this is going to be an issue. Let mm -hmm. me kind of move this around. Maybe I'm going to, you know, assign this. And I have a great project manager. So, you know, they're always looking where tasks are being behind on mm -hmm. and delegating to, you know, uh, to get them caught mm -hmm. up and things like that. We have weekly meet, staff calls, everything like it's a real business and mm. it's it's regardless of what people may say may say because it, it could be unbelievable you know whatever but i'm doing it right and my clients are happy and i've even had one client send me a text message of other publishers that are coming after them like hey we know you're over at mezzo but you know we can offer you this and we can do that and we can and they're like tammy look at what they're sending me it's like <laughs> i told them i'm not going anywhere like i love you know, everything that you stand right. for. I know that you're doing it from a place of passion mm -hmm. and I know that you have a team and everything's organized. So if I have a question, you're going to, you're going to be able to give me the answer. Right. You know, that that's important. That's important. You're collecting somebody's money, you know? And so I've just really made that my mission. Um, and it is a labor of love and, you know, it, also kind of required me to retire from songwriting right. because it is a lot and all that support is important. You know, mm -hmm. having a team, having a business operations manager, project manager, you know, having, you know, my copyright manager, um, you know, licensing coordinator, just having all those places, um, uh, those, par those positions in place. And then also still running an internship program, an apprenticeship program that allows the development and training, right. you know, that's ultimately what it's about. I want to be a part of training the next generation of music mm. publishing executives, teaching them the right way. A, a, a lot of our interns have gone on to get jobs with Sound Exchange, Warner, um, MLC. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's amazing to me. To yeah, if, if I'm just the breeding ground to kind of help and develop, and then you know cultivate, and then you go on and do mm -hmm. amazing things. I'm not mad at that. That I did my job. You know, you left with value. You're now an asset to a bigger corporation. Mm -hmm. And it came from the foundation that you got at Mezzo. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that that just speaks to the legacy that you're building for yourself and for for the Mezzo agency. Thank you. That's that's kudos. So kudos to you for doing that. Thank you so um, much. And being being uh, a front person to uh, to educate the next generation of music publishers and, and creative. So thank um, you. I am honored to do it. Um, 
And I'm learning now, you know, that, you know, I have a, a broader team. Um, I, I'm learning how to really just kind of bask in and enjoying mm-hmm. what has been built. I think those first couple of years, I think we're, we're going on six years. So those first three years, three to four years, Tough. five years, like we didn't even turn a profit. Everything was coming in and going out, coming in, going out, coming in, going out. Um, and so, you know, it changes when the IRS sends you a bill (laughs) (laughs) and you like, Oh, Oh, okay. Uh, This is what this feel like. Okay. Okay. All right. right. You know, but we are officially in business, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and I encourage, you know, anybody who's watching this, whether you're in music, um, the music business or not, um, I encourage you guys to just be steadfast. Please educate yourself on your, on the industry you're in. Like, just don't, you know, work and try to figure it out on your own. Take some classes, get a mentor, get developed, you know, have someone pouring into you or watch videos and take the little online courses that you need to help you become secure and confident in Mm. the business industry that you're in. And even with songwriters and producers who are now, like you were saying, having to kind of put that that other hat on. T- take some classes. It's okay if you have to go back to school. It's okay if you have to get a job in an in an area that you're trying to strengthen sure. just so you can learn because look at the value that you're walking away with and you have consistent income coming in. You know? It's a win win. So it's a win win. I'm never, never against that. I've I've encouraged a lot of my writers and producers, you know, well, what is it that you see yourself doing within three to five years? Is it media? Are you doing more content creation? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, cool. Let's like Look into what that looks like. You know, are you wanting to start a media brand that coincides with your production? Okay, great. What does that look like? Let's kind of iron that out and develop mm-hmm. it. So I'm I'm serving as more of an asset to them. And then I speak the language from the creative side because I'm a creative right. first. So I'm 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 helping to, you know, develop them as well while they're producing songwriting, but also realizing, hey, I need to get some more income coming in or I need to kind of branch off because I just don't want to be a songwriter. I also want to do other things. So all of my expertise, I'm like, yo, we're scheduling consultations. Do you have any questions about anything? Is there anything I can help you with? You know, how can I be an asset to you? I had to shut my calendar down. We're not taking any new clients right now. Mm. We're not taking any new clients right now because my current clients are my priority. And, you know, those free music business calls that we were doing, that was great. We'll, we'll start them in the fall, mm-hmm. but I literally could not, we could not take on, I, I wanted to make sure we didn't lose sight mm-hmm. of what we currently have, I because I think that's a problem that businesses get when they start growing really, yes, really ma'am. fast. They forget about the, the, the main clients and overall the experience mm-hmm. that you were giving. You need to still maintain oh, yeah. that same experience while the company is growing. And it's okay. If you got to slow down sometime to speed up, do that. But that's where we are right now. We're in a place where we're cool. I'm not like, you know, begging for anybody to sign with us. We're, we're good. We're in a good position where, you know, we don't have to really take on as many clients right now. We have enough to manage. And, um, and I, and I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful. And, and I know with the new campaign that we're launching and, Um, 25, you know, we'll be able to, you know, kind of open it back up a little bit, but I'm just, I'm very, being very intentional right now. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Uh, Just being very purposeful and focused. uh, The only way. On the foundation of what made the Mesua Agency the Mesua Agency. Well, Tammy, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. It has been a pleasure, of course, to reconnect once again. Yes. uh, And to, to see you and to hear more about your story, more about your journey. Um, so I greatly appreciate you coming on to the Indie Unplugged. Thank you for having me. Shout out to Indie Unplugged. Shout out to the Indie Unplugged. We <laughs> create music in. TV. Let's go. Yes, let's, let's go. go. <laughs> so she's going to have to open um, one of them schedules so I can get some consultation <laughs> in there somewhere. But uh, <laughs> You know we're going to make it happen. You know we're going to make it happen. Make it happen somehow. Uh, but once again, thank you very much. Thank you for having um, me. It's been a pleasure. Sure. It's been a pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much for attending uh, another episode of the Indie Unplugged, uh, of course, with myself, B. Vaughn, and my wonderful guest, Tammy Luttrell. Thank you. Uh, you can always catch all of our interviews and all of our master classes and episodes and sync masters and our different programs on our website, wecreatemusic.tv. So head over, right? Appreciate you tuning in. Peace. <laughs>